Okay, everyone. Well, welcome to this contact webinar. If there is a technical hitch, please do bear with us. Those of you joining by PC, laptop, tablet or smartphone should now be able to see this introduction slide. So I'll just talk you through timings and questions. As there's so many attendees, you will all remain muted throughout the webinar and go to, to ask a question of the presenters. Please use the question icons on the GoToWebinar toolbar on your screen. This will allow you to type your question into the text box and submit this to the webinar administrator. And we will select as many relevant questions to answer as the time allows. And if similar questions are received, they will be condensed where possible. Alternatively, if we're inundated with questions, we'll pull together a frequently asked questions sheet that will be uploaded with the webinar after the end of the, the recording. So hello, so we're going to do a brief introduction of the presenters um, before we get started into the slides so that you've got an understanding of um, where we come from and our expertise in the areas that we're going to discuss. So my name's Lorraine Walker and I have my own company offering business support and training services. And I'm here today as an associate consultant for contact. My career spans over 30 years of working with children and families. 15 of those years has been in the private and voluntary sectors, supporting children and families with childcare services and training. I've also worked in the further education field, delivering accredited qualifications to families sorry, delivering accredited qualification courses for those supporting families, including psychology programmes. I've worked 10 years in the public sector as a manager supporting um, childcare providers with training and also leadership programmes. I was a strategic manager supporting um, the development of short breaks for disabled children and their families. And also as a freelance consultant, I was delivering across the North East Local Authorities, the legal duties placed on local authorities around the Children and Families Act and the new SEND Code of Practice to local authorities in relation to the single education health and care plans. So that's just a brief sort of summary of myself and I'm pleased to be joined today by Carla who's a parent from the Darlington Forum. So I'm now going to hand over to Carla and she'll introduce herself. Hi, um, I'm Carla. I'm here to represent Darlington Parent Care Forum today. First and foremost, I'm a mum of three beautiful girls, um, two of whom have additional needs. Prior to becoming involved in the forum, I was a SEND officer within both a primary and secondary school before having to take some time out due to my caring responsibilities. I'm here today as the forum coordinator for Darlington and later on I'll be telling you all a bit about my forum and how we run. So that, that's us. So we're now going to talk you through what we're going to cover in this short webinar. So what we hope you will take away from this webinar today is an overview of employment law and HMRC principles in relation to employing um, staff within your forum looking at the volunteer, the employed person, the self-employed person and what we don't like to look at is redundancies but as an employer you have to be made aware of the processes of making people redundant if that unfortunate situation arises. Um, the decision making, so we're looking at identifying what needs to be done during your um, forum, what you want, the roles are required, do, you, do the roles require a DBS check? Do you have job descriptions and responsibilities? So all the decisions on overall responsibility, for example, the forum as an employer, or does the forum uh, provide the support of a host organisation who will be that accountable body for HMRC and paying forum staff? And Carla will touch on that. Well, she'll go into more detail, I should say, at her section within the webinar. We'll look at pre-recruitment what the processes that you do within pre-recruitment, identifying questions, agreeing formal and informal processes specific to roles, who will be involved in the interview process, where you will advertise those roles, your induction into how the forum runs, explaining the processes involved, 
ensuring they understand your policies and procedures, they have safeguarding training, if they have a contract of employment or a volunteering agreement, and who provides that line management support and manages the post and all the roles and responsibilities and also identifies training needs and CPD. So today, supporting the, the forums is about having the right people with the right skills doing the right role within the forum. So Carla and I are now going to walk you through a series of slides that look at the various roles and activities that people will do within a forum. Hopefully the content will assist you to make informed choices or highlight certain areas that you recognise your forum would benefit from making a few changes. Ultimately, it is our intention within this webinar today to offer information and guidance to assist you in making those changes where required and hopefully to offer some food for thought to help you to improve the effectiveness of your own forum. So the work needed to maintain an effective forum, you may not be a stranger to this slide because we can see from this slide that forums carry out a wide range of activities, roles and responsibilities that is involved in running an organisation like a parent carer forum. Forums are responsible and accountable for the grant they receive and any additional funding that they may receive, for example, from a local authority. And the forums must demonstrate how they monitor and evaluate on how this money is spent. Therefore, it's fundamentally important that forums discuss what you need in terms of staffing and volunteers to assist you in carrying out those identified roles and responsibilities. Are you going to need paid workers? Are you going to be the employer yourself as a forum? and do all the necessary paperwork for HMRC and adhere to employment law legislation? Are you going to engage with the host organisation to assist with the employment law aspects? Carla will talk more about this shortly, but we can see from this slide that forums have lots of things to consider to ensure the effective running of their forum, so getting the HR part right is fundamental. Here's a sample of the voluntary roles within a forum. Now, many of you will be very familiar with the different roles as far as the volunteers concerned. So I'm not going to talk about each individual point here, but you can see that there's very similar roles within your own forum and lots of parents doing a range of different jobs, all on a voluntary basis. So from a committee member, right down to someone who's attending a strategic, uh, strategic arrangements, engagement, sorry, and also someone who's uh, taken minutes from meetings. But the next slide covers sample paid roles in a forum. So if your forum is a community interest company, you might have directors who are paid to run the forum, and you could have administrators responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the forum, managing your database, etc. You may have a paid treasurer, who's responsible for carrying out the financial monitoring, or you may have someone paid to do this, for example, through a host organisation. Again, Carla will discuss this in more detail. So we're here today to with, with a parent representative coordinator, Carla. So that is a role of someone who oversees the request for parent participation. But I'm going to hand over to Carla here and she'll explain that that is her role. Hi, yeah, so in, in Darlington, I'm the parent coordinator for the forum, um, and that's my role is to oversee the request for parent participation, recruitment, training, and support of parent representatives, acting as the line manager to volunteers that we have to make sure that they're supported and able to fulfill their roles effectively, and promotion of the, the role of um, parent reps, and promoting the forum and overseeing the database and day to day running of the forum. Thanks, Carla. And there's also a development officer that may liaise with, with local authorities, but that some of these roles may overlap between each other. And But that's just an, an example of what paid roles are within the forums. So it's up to the, each individual forum to identify the name of the roles or the type of roles that they need within their forum. So if you go down the employer route, you need to decide on rates of pay. So you'll need to decide reasonable rates of pay, not just national minimum wage. You can do this by talking with other forums. 
or research the voluntary sector pay scales. Um, so note well that the pay should reflect the complexity of the role and the skills that are required to do that role. And if you engage with a host organisation, will you adopt their pay scales or will you set your own? And also the charity sector has a history of using the NGP scales, which is the National Joint Council for Local Government Services. So you can talk to your local authority to see what they would pay or your local voluntary sector organisations. And here we're going to look at under understanding employment law and HMRC. So really what we're trying to, to get the information across today is before you make any decisions relating to employing a worker, you should understand employment law and your accountability as the employer to HMRC. We've listed some bullet points here, but they've all got links taken from the government website that you can, once you get the PowerPoint uploaded onto the contact site, you'll have access that will take you direct to these documents that will help you in registering an, an employer as an employer and setting up your PAYE and all the different bullet points here. So your agreed written statement of employment, look at your employment liability, being able to inform HMRC that you've got a new employee, do the P45 want to work out their tax code and using the HMRC starter list. So you can see that it's quite fundamentally important that you understand the, the difference between being an employer or engaging with a host because you have to check what to do when starting paying someone for the first time. In addition to understanding employment law and HMRC, as an employer, forums should be mindful of all of these bullet points, pensions, maternity pay, workers' rights, contractual agreements if, if you're choosing someone to be self-employed. So it's just, the will, will the forum be the employer and pay direct, or will you choose a host organisation to manage your grant and support the, the pay? These are all decisions that the forum as an organisation has to agree and decide themselves. It's worth noting here that volunteers, although they make up a huge um, uh, sort of representation of parent carer forums, volunteers don't, excuse me, have the right, the same rights as employees as they're not paid for their work. They should therefore not have a contract of employment but they may have a volunteering agreement in place, but this is not the same as an employment contract. The main differences between an employee and a volunteer are, a volunteer doesn't get paid for their work. As a volunteer, they're not allowed to receive any payment or benefit in kind or other reward for the work. And if you're getting this, then that might legally be classed as an employee. What a, for, a volunteer should receive is a reimbursement of out-of-pocket expenses because a volunteer carries out these activities of their own free will. So a volunteer agreement shouldn't have any language that suggests employment. Moving on again to the understanding employment law in HMRC, another area to be mindful of as an employer is how to support a worker through redundancy. So ACAS is the Advisory Consolidation and Arbitration Service and this organisation provides free and impartial information and advice to employers and employees on all aspects of the workplace. And this link here will take you direct to the website and you can, there's also a contact number that you can contact to get some advice. And most employers would support their workforce through the redundancy process and signpost them to additional support where appropriate. Nobody really likes to talk about redundancy because it's not a very nice situation to be in. But if you are the employer, then you'd have to have been mindful of an understanding of the processes that you would have to do to support your member of staff who's been made redundant. And that's including the redundancy pay, um, how the redundancy is selected, um, notice periods, legal notice periods, consultation periods, 
um, and supporting them to find suitable alternative employment, helping them to find that new job. And all these links here will take you direct to the government website again. So we've tried to include as much signposting and guidance for you rather than just a few slides on a webinar. These are real live documents on the government website at the moment. But you can see the importance of understanding the HMRC responsibilities and employment law requirements. Even in this short webinar and a few slides, there's lots of information and links to take you to additional documentation. So it's important that you understand if you go down the employer route, you understand your accountability and responsibility as being the employer, if that's the route that you choose to go down. There's also the self-employed route. So maybe you don't want to go down the employer route. Maybe the forum doesn't want all the uh, responsibility of dealing with HMRC and employment law and the uh, pay as you earn and national insurance and pensions and holiday pay and workers rights because it is a minefield and you need to get your head around it but some forums run quite happily and successfully as an employer and others go down the self-employed route um, and they don't these these forums they don't want to be the employer and they also don't want to engage the support of a host organization so they look at the roles as more of an ad hoc. That's if they have specific pieces of work that the forum would like to do, but they don't want to put in place a paid worker to do that role. They just want to employ a self-employed person through a consultancy route to deliver a project or a piece of work as a self-employed. And if they do that, if that is the option the forum decides, the forum would need to agree and write out exactly what it is they want that specific piece of work to do. You then would, would market the opportunity and get expressions of interest. And you would ask for quotes for doing the piece of work that you require doing. You need to be able to do this so that you can compare and contrast what different consultants would do for your project within the, the sort of financial constraints of what the forum can offer for that piece of work. You need to ensure that the whoever you consult with or bring in in a self-employed capacity, that they fully understand that it's their full responsibility for their own tax and accounting records. It's not the forum's responsibility. It's the individual who's doing the piece of work for you. And you need to emphasise that, that that consultant is not entitled to full employment benefits, such as pension, annual leave, holiday pay, sick pay, etc. So this may be an area that some forums would like to go down to do a piece of work for them. And once you've done that, if that's the route you choose, you would then make sure that you, the consultant that you employ for that period of time signs a contractual agreement with you so that they fully understand their position, what the forum expects them to do within a a time frame. So now we're going to look at decision making. So decide as a forum what is the best structure for you. Does the forum become the employer and put all the necessary infrastructure, systems and processes in place? Or do you enlist the help of a host organisation, which again Carla will discuss shortly. If you opt for the host, Will you adopt their systems and processes or will it be a mix of both? Will you agree a joint responsibility model where the forum will make decisions, but the host will be a, the accountable organisation for all the employment law, HMRC and paying your staff? And again, Carla's coming up shortly to discuss that in more detail. So we're going to now look at the pre-recruitment stage. So once you are clear on the structure that you, oh sorry, I've just noticed a typo in the word structure, my apologies. Once you are clear on the structure and you've identified what needs doing in your forum, 
you can then make a list of tasks and see if those tasks can be grouped together to make a role or roles and you can do you can divide roles so that they become either a volunteer role and they are less arduous for you you will need to identify if the roles will be as a paid or a voluntary situation is the work going to be temporary short term is it going to be a project or is it is it going to be ongoing work that will require so many hours per week You'll need to identify which role requires um, a DBS check and who will pay for this. Will the organisation, the forum pay for this? Will, will your host pay for this if that's what you've chosen to do? Will the individual pay for it? All these decisions have to be taken into, into consideration before you get during the pre-recruitment stage. So once you've identified the employed roles, you need to produce job description and person specs so that you can attract the right people for the right positions within your forum. And remember we mentioned before that volunteers roles are not employed roles, so their, their processes are less formal. However, a volunteer will still need a brief overview of what is expected of them within the forum and given a clear understanding of what activities they will engage in to represent the forum. And you can see the contact webinar on supporting volunteers for more information on this link here. Oops, beg your pardon. So once you've sort of sorted out your pre-recruitment information, you then produce an application form and agree your induction process, maybe with your host organisation. Another typo, I do beg your pardon. You also need to be mindful of the importance of equal opportunities and there's a link there that tells you about the, the laws and the legislation ar around advertising. Ensure you widen your recruitment by having an open process, one that is fair and transparent. Others in your forum may have the particular skills that you're looking for that you actually don't know about. Often committee members inherit roles that they don't feel comfortable with. Um, and they're happy to pass the baton on, leaving them free to support the forum in other ways. I think I've got a different slide, have I? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Um, let's have a look here. And also to be mindful of the GDPR principles, data protection, how you collect, share and store the personal information relating to candidates who complete the information paperwork. Another thing that, that promotes transparency and fairness is to have a pre-interview checklist. So agree your interview questions are prepared in advance and allocate to the appropriate interviewer. Uh, make sure you've got a room reserved and is appropriate for the candidate's uh, confidentiality. Water and glasses are provided and all other devices are switched off interviews so or when you're opening the interviews to try and put the, the candidate at ease so that they feel that they're going to get the best out of themselves in the interview because they have a supportive interview panel. So you may have your own checklist um, or you can access checklists on the internet. So here's, a, here's an example that was taken from um, the internet which is a summary for everyone on the panel to look at and score the candidate's communication, their confidence, their experience, and their soft skills. So what is the, how, what's their demeanor? Um, do they give eye contact? Do they, do they feel comfortable? And everyone can score so that it's a fair process for all. So the interview process. So I'm just making sure that I've got, yeah. So if a friend has been shortlisted for an interview, the fair and transparent process would mean that they would um, not be on that interview panel. And then the panel should involve an objective person such as a local authority officer, um, one that they respect, for example, a SENDIAS officer or someone from another voluntary sector, an experienced person, someone that you trust to help you make the right decision. And then if your friend is appointed, then it's because he or she was the right person for the position. 
and not because a friend was on the panel. Everyone should be asked the same questions at interview and using a scoring process to plot the scores and comments after each candidate has left the interview. This helps at the selection process and prevents forgetting the responses. Allow five to ten minutes in between interviews to allow for fair scoring based on the answers you've been given. And this avoids the panel getting mixed up as what each candidate, candidate said what. And the panel will then discuss from their individual scores who's the best person for the position to represent the forum. So the induction. So this is providing inf information on who the other parent reps are within your forum. So this is once you've appointed someone, so they're now going through the induction process. So it's really relevant that they understand who the other parents are that are representing the forum that they are now um, going to be representing. So ensure that who you have appointed reads and understands your policies and procedures of the forum and promote the forum resources available on contact website to further support the worker, provide opportunities for the worker to have Q&A sessions with you, encourage the worker to familiarise themselves on a range of uh, disabilities to, pro to, mo excuse me, to promote their wider awareness and um, not just in the areas of their own children and ensure they have safeguarding, child protection, the general data protection regulations and other relevant training. Also, uh, there's a few notes here that you could use an induction process checklist. So how do they introduce themselves when they're meeting people? Um, show them where they'll be working, talk them through some of the key policies and let them read others, for example, a code of conduct, how you would like them to present and represent the forum. Talk them through the expenses and remuneration policy, if it's a volunteer, or their wages, if it's an employed worker. And as well as training and safeguarding, they should, read the they should also read the policy and they should also sign that they've read the policies. Um, so make the induction process warm and welcoming. Explain who they'll report to, who's their line manager. And if you're enlisting the help of a host organisation, um, who they'll be their employer. Or make sure um, you're involved in the induction process in some of the line management meetings. Perhaps if you're working with the host, you could have quarterly three-way meetings with their line manager as well as yourself in the forum to make sure that they understand the work needed by the forum and the deadlines and talk through any issues if there's any overlap with um, the HMRC employment law line management responsibilities. It's good practice for forums to have an induction process for all new committee members, volunteers and paid workers to help them settle into the role and understand how the forum works and ensure they are clear about what's expected of them. Also, as part of the induction process, discuss the following. So the co-production ladder, engaging with others, promoting participation, working in partnership, consulting, marketing and promotion. It's all part of co-production. Then I'll make sure that they're aware of the forum's future plans, the, the National Network for Parent Care of Forums, your regional forum networks, the DFE grant funding, other funding streams, who the forum links with, so strategic local authorities, strategic groups, the importance of working in partnership with local authorities, some of the key research that's been done locally by some of the other parents on the forum. And you, you also may have an induction checklist to ensure that you follow a standardised format. And you may also consider using the one on the ACAS website. So basically, this information is just to avoid information overload. So you could give it over a period of a um, few weeks during a probationary period. So your, their induction could take place over a period of weeks. Um, because the last thing you want to do is overload people with uh, information and then they get that whole feeling of overwhelm. The next slide talks about line management. 
Um, so provide an, a named line manager to support the role, whether that's a voluntary role or a paid role. And if you opt for a host organisation, you can agree if they're going to take on this responsibility. Is it going to be a joint responsibility? Or even if you use a host, is it going to be um, that the forum will line manage? So all these things have to be discussed beforehand. So if a host organisation is your preferred option, you may decide on jointly supporting the staff members and then agree who will provide that continuous professional development. Is that going to be jointly if you're engaged with a host um, using contact resources online and the forums access to training? Could you maybe, maybe access the local authority training and additional training? So who's going to provide that additional support? Um, and these are examples of additional training that could be on offer for volunteers and parent carers, communication and interpersonal skills, negotiating skills, managing self, that's a big one. That's understanding your own trigger points for overwhelm and if you're taking on too much work and who you can talk to if that's the, the, the situation for you. And also self-belief and confidence, knowing that you're doing a good job and understanding your own um, confidence and skills levels. So some forums have a memorandum of understanding or agreement with their host organisation so that the expectations around line management and CPD are clear um, with clear boundaries um, of a worker for the worker and that is set out in the agreement. In addition, all forums are run differently and there is no one size fits all. So many parents dedicate a lot of their free time to their forums and this could mean that an employed worker may do additional voluntary hours, making line management a fundamentally part of sorry, making line management a fundamental part of monitoring, evaluating and being that on go support. And Carla's going to touch on that as well. So the balance between close management and allowing a new person to use their own initiative can be a difficult one. A line manager will be required to juggle between giving clear direction on a specific task and monitoring progress to ensure it's completed and knowing when a person fully understands their role and can get on with things. But by the same token, also recognising when a worker is feeling overwhelmed or stressed and should be able to offer a coaching and mentoring approach to help the person look at their current workload and home life to support them to find an effective balance. So if you have line management and leadership in place, this ensures the forum runs effectively and the workers know the processes as a representative of the forum and knows the support that's in place. So moving on in line management, in order to ensure that your worker feels a welcome and valued member of your forum, it's good practice to have systems and processes in place for which to induct them into the new, into the way things run. Systems and processes also ensures the forum follows HR protocols if things go wrong and if you need to deal with difficult situations. So to assist in this process, Decide on a probationary period. This lets you have a protocol in place to check how people are coping. Let them know, let them know this during the induction phase so that they're aware of the probationary period. And it allows you to monitor stress triggers and make adjustments and put support in place. Also during the probationary period, you should receive regular one-to-one -one meetings and catch up conversations. Your HR protocols should also have formal supervision so that, a for, so, so that as a forum you can formalise progress or identify areas for improvement, set targets and monitor the progress towards what you hope to achieve. Coaching and mentoring is a behavioural approach and it's one that offers both support and challenge. So we're now going to move on to that CPD element, that continuous professional development, which is the line man manager's responsibility. 
So CPD, short for Continuous Professional Development, forums offer training to their parents as part of this CPD. There's local authority training that forum members may be offered places on. Other organisations put on training and will allow parent care forum members to attend them free of charge. You need to be aware of what's going on in your local area. And if you work with a host, you may have access to all their training. And a go-to website for all forums and for a host of, sorry, let me say that again. A go-to website, website for a host of resources the forum and forum related support and training is also available on the contact website. And for access to webinars and other resources, you can add, you can access them on this link here, the contact website. So that's the information slides around HR. So I'm now going to hand you over to Carla, who's going to talk you through her experience in the Darlington Forum in engaging with a host organisation. Over to you, Carla. Hi again, everybody. Um, so the forum in its current, mo current model in Darlington has been going for around three years now. And on a whole, we're really happy with it. We're currently made up of six committee group members and a forum coordinator, which is me. And we choose to pay a host organisation, which I'll give you more details on in a little bit. We have, sorry. I'm getting told I'm talking too fast, so I slow down. <laughs> um, we are only a small authority and we have over 350 members currently. We've got strong partnerships with both the local authority and health in our local area. So for a little bit of background on the forum. Oh, I've just done that. <laughs> Sorry, I got ahead of myself again. That was the background on the forum. So the decision making for the day to day running of the forum um, is done by the committee group, which is parent care and carers. And we decide what we want to be on the grant application with a parent being the applicant and our host organisation being the grant signatory. I'm the only paid worker within the forum and I get paid for 11 hours per week. Myself and other parent volunteers sit on strategic groups and then with other parents on different work streams that feed into that. When looking at our grant each year and our priorities, we would always ask the wider parent membership, what do we want the forum to look like and what are our priorities? The committee group then decide what our focus should be and where we believe we have the most influence. My role includes promoting co-production, engaging with the wider parent group and overseeing the day-to-day -day running of the forum and that in itself is vast and varied and impossible to put into words. Um, it's worth mentioning here, we pay our host organisation a, a small percentage of our grant and in, the employment salary comes from that too. We don't receive any additional funding from anywhere else. So the benefits to Darlington Forum of working with a host organisation are as follows. Our host organisation is the employer and provide all employment support, HMRC, training opportunities, and it takes away the accountability and responsibility of employment law from us as parents. And we find that this works for us. We adhere to our post organisation's policies and procedures because we actually agree with them. And it means we are covered and protected by their insurances. We have our own code of conduct and forum related policies. We have access to the finance department, but regular meetings not we have access to the finance department, but also regular meetings and HR support. Following the finance procedures by raising purchase order numbers, ETC, means we have accountability and systems in place to constantly monitor finance. And we meet regularly to check where things stand and do a grant variation if necessary. Our host organisation assists us in the management of the grant and we use their financial control policy and finance department. We feel this frees us up to concentrate on participation and has enabled us to grow into the strong forum we feel we are currently. We also have assistance in the recruitment of the volunteers and training and also DBS checks. Having a line manager or go to person is a safety net and they support me, but also pull me back during times of overwhelm, which can be quite often. 
to put a plan in place and look at the workload. The forum is ultimately parent-led, but we're supported. We have access to volunteers from other projects within our host organisation to help when, for instance, we're having a conference and there's big mail outs and preparation. It also helps us in reaching more parents as our host organisation comes into contact with families that we might not reach otherwise. And we are provided with office space and a base. The additional benefits of working with a host if overwhelm or stress set in, if things go wrong, if we have employment issues or if you received a complaint. For instance, last year I was not well and I had a period of six weeks when I was absent. The host, my line manager, stepped in and met with the committee group to make sure things kept going in my absence. He already had oversight of what was happening due to our, our meetings and supported the forum, forum practically during my absence. They've never received a complaint about me, but I'm sure I'd be pulled up if they did. And that's, sorry, that's all from me now. Thank you, Carla. So we'll move on here now just to discuss pitfalls so things that might go wrong so it's it's um so mindful here at this point to put in the pitfalls because sometimes not everything goes according to plan so if we look here at um just a couple of little examples the worker isn't doing what they're supposed to do they're attending strategic meetings themselves but you really want them to recruit parents to act as parent reps so these are just some examples of solutions. So that's why it's important that getting your HR right and having your systems and processes in place is there to support you when things do go wrong, because you can have one-to-one -one, um, sort of meetings with them, recording key priorities or any issues. So you're, you're nipping things in the bud before they escalate into big, big problems. So you're meeting with them and talking through with them and sort of understanding their perspective on what they're doing because you don't want people going off and sort of um, doing their own thing when it's not meeting the needs of the forum and by having these systems and processes in place you can revisit their job description check if it's misleading talk them through what you're wanting in case they've misunderstood and basically um, develop an action plan and set targets with time scales and monitor the progress. That's the line management responsibility. And again, that is that support mechanism for the worker or the volunteer to know that there's systems and processes and support in place because you've got robust HR systems there. So it's, it's a two way street. It's not just if things go wrong with a worker, it's just so that the worker also understands where they sit within the organisation. The next point, the worker doesn't have the skills to do the job. Um, so they don't have the right experiences, for example. The worker has been asked to do the accounts, but they've been putting up, putting all the receipts in a drawer and not done anything with them. I mean, this is, this is real life issues, real life stuff. So the solution could be that you look to see if that's part of their job description. Is it because there's too much is expected of them in the hours they have? Does their workload need to be looked at or do they prefer doing other things? That's what I was talking about. Their skills level lend themselves to doing other activities. And during the one-to-one, -one, discuss the issues openly with them, listen to their views. Maybe is it some basic training that they need? Um, so get advice at this point. Uh, so if they don't have the skills, would some basic training help? Or do they need to consider firmer actions? As they said at interview, that they could do the accounts, but now you're, un you're, you're understanding mm -hmm. that they can't. So you need some advice at this point. And that's what I was talking about before. If you're the employer, you use ACAS, HMRC, employment law, access all the documentations on the government website about getting your HR right. Uh, if you're in a host organisation, then obviously you would go through their HR systems and processes and support. Um, and then another issue at the bottom here is the host organisation gives the worker different priorities to the ones the forum has. Yeah. I'm just going to ask Carla to step in here. 
Yeah, well, when we looked at this, I said it doesn't happen in our situation because we've got a robust agreement already in place and that we set our own priorities. And the host is just there to provide the back office and the support for the forum. Yeah, thank you. So what might go wrong? So despite putting all those systems and processes in place, the worker is still not doing what they're supposed to do, or you have a worker is often long term sick, or you receive a complaint about a worker, whether that's safeguarding issue or a code of conduct issue. So this slide is going to sort of just remind you not to bury your head in the hope that all those things is going to go away and don't feel that you're on your own either because if you follow your own systems and processes and HR protocols you will have a sort of format of how to deal with those situations and you will have those things in place because if you are the employer you would already have got all your HMR and employment law systems embedded in the infrastructure of your forum and if you're not to the employer the host will help you with that but ultimately, you can talk things through with your regional advisor in, in contact. And you can, I've mentioned before about going through the host organisation's internal policies. You can also get help from external organisations who provide HR support. And in addition to that, local authorities may also offer help from their HR services or through a local voluntary organisation. Again, you can access the help and guidance from organisations like ACAS and at advising communities. Now, I'd like to mention here that Contact has paid a subscription for each parent carer forum to advising communities, which they've had info about and you, which you've had info, information about. And you can ask them questions via email and then you can buy additional expertise from them. So if you're not sure about that, contact your regional um, advisor and contact for more information about this. Because again, this is an organisation that can provide that additional HR support. And that concludes our webinar on getting your HR right. So we're now going to stop for a few moments to take any questions, if anyone has any questions around this. Oh, but I've just had an email come through from Nandini and the question is, can volunteers be re re remunerated for meetings apart from expenses? Again, that would, be that would be decided at the very beginning of your forum's organisational policies and procedures um, and what the, the meeting is about. So if it's a relevant meeting that's part of the forum's um, priorities, and then yes, they would be remunerated for their expenses. Um, I'm just going to hand over to Carla now um, to answer that in more detail. Yeah, I think it, it, it really depends on what your local forum um, have in place for their procedure around that. We ask this question every time we do our grant every year in how we're going to have our structure and we our volunteers decide that they don't want to claim remuneration apart from expenses, but that they'd rather have the paid worker role. Um, but every area is different, so it would really depend on your local forum and what their current policy is. Thanks for that, Carla. We're just going to hang on another few, few minutes for any more questions. OK, we've had another question in here from Jordan. And the question is, if the forum has an opening for a paid worker and you already have someone in mind for the role, for example, the person has already been doing the job as a volunteer. Do we have to open it up to the, the public first? What we're actually seeing here, Jordan, in part of the webinar is that any recruitment for any paid role is an open process. And yes, you may have someone who's been doing the role at voluntary, but just to make it equal opportunities, you would promote that um, position into the, the wider forum um, and if, if the person who's doing the volunteering role at the moment is the right person for the job, then they would be appointed into the paid role. Would you like to add any more to that, Carla? No, um, and also we've got a question here from Jenny. Um, do you have an example of a host organisation? Yeah, so in Darlington, um, 
our host organisation is a local voluntary organisation, which has been around for around, well, it was the 30 year anniversary last year. So um, obviously they were our um, first first choice because it would seem natural. But um, I know people um, of forums who work with carers support um, charities and things like that. So um, it, it would really depend on what's available in your area. So from Susan, if parents are wanting to get paid, can they be paid? And I think that again comes down, it, it would come under remuneration. And again, that would come down to your local forum's current policy around remuneration and being pa paid for attending meetings or things. Or if it was that you were going to have a paid worker, that would have to go through the employment process that we've talked about today. Um, and it is down to what what each local area um, decides at that grant meeting and what they put in the grant and how they decide to, to run the forum. And it's also worth mentioning here that some parents don't want to get paid because yeah. it interferes with their, any benefits that they're receiving or anything. So it's worth listening, as Carla says, going back to your forum, it's not just a case of can parents get paid if they want to get paid. There's a whole infrastructure and rules and responsibilities and systems and protocols that have to be in place. And as Carla said, you need to revisit each individual forum is different. They're set up differently. Their systems and processes are different. Their grant responsibilities and targets are different. So if that's something that, that you, Susan, in your forum, if that's something that you would like to take forward, that could be an agenda item on yeah. the next forum meeting. Yeah, and definitely be voted on and discussed. I can obviously only um, speak for Darlington. But in Darlington, the whole um, benefits and interfering with them is the reason why our parent volunteers choose not to be paid remuneration for attending meetings and instead have a designated person to do that for them. Thanks. I've just had another um, sort of email from Jordan. Um, he missed the, the answer to the last question. Oh, okay. So hi, Jordan. I hope you've stopped typing now and you can hear us now. So Jordan's question was, if the forum has an opening for a paid position and they already have a person in mind for the role, uh, for example, someone who's been doing that job um, as a volunteer role, um, but they now have decided that they want to have a paid worker doing that role, they're asking if they have to open it up to the public first. And the answer, Jordan, is you have to have an open process, an open recruitment process, when you go back and revisit the slides, you'll see that there, you, you have to be mindful of equal opportunities. And yes, that volunteer may get the job in the end anyway, but you have to make sure that you're not just employing someone because they're already doing a job and they're there. It has to be a clear, transparent and fair process for anybody else to apply for the job. And that's not saying that you don't have um, someone else in the forum that may have the same skills as your volunteer, but you're making it a, a fair and a transparent process of recruitment, especially if someone wants to have a job. You cannot just say, oh, so-and-so was in place, so we're just going to give it to them anyway. That's not a fair, open and equal opportunity process. So I hope that answered your question, Jordan. But it was a very good question. Thanks for that. Okay, that's the end of the webinar. For, um, hopefully you've had some useful hints and tips and some sort of signposting to some legal documents to help you understand your responsibilities of getting your HR right and if you choose to be the employer or engage with the host organisation. So um, any further questions can still be put in. I'm just going to put on the, the last slide that a short questionnaire will launch at the end of this webinar and ask you to please take the time to complete it as it will help contact plan future online training events, including other topics that you would like to see. And a recording of this webinar, presentation slides and questions um, will be put on the parent uh, participation resources page of contacts website within the next week or two and an email confirming this will be sent to you once this is available. 
So um, I would like to say thank you for listening and um, I hope it's been useful and thank you very much and I'll pass over now for Carla to say goodbye. Hi, um, yeah, thank you very much for listening and please do send over any questions that you have. Thank you, bye. And that ends the webinar.